Well, this morning as we uh, continue in this series, we're in this thing called Project Live. What does it really mean to live? What does it really mean to, to come alive? What does it mean to have a real life? What does it mean to have an abundant life? And, uh, and we began this last week, and we talked about worship last week. It's in worship where we come to know and love God that we find meaning and we find purpose in living. And today we're going to be in Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse number 28, as we look at what I would call a family connection. A family connection. Now, as way of introduction into this text, I want to share with you a couple of things in this, in this spiritual journey of living. And it's the stages of relationship. In the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews writes and says, For it was fitting that he, speaking of Christ, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Bringing many sons to glory. Essentially what this is telling us is that God wanted a family. As a matter of fact, God wanted you to be a part of that family. The Bible teaches us that God planned out the entirety of the universe. He planned out eternity so that we could be born, so that we could share in His glory, and so that we could be a part of His family. You know, I think it's important to everybody that want, they want to be a part of something. They want to be a part of a football team. They want to be a part of a basketball team. They want to be a part of an Olympic team. I mean, we've had a tremendous uh, Olympics this past week. Michael Phelps, that guy is a beast. I mean, you know, I just loved it that the Russian dude was up there taunting him uh, for one of the swims, and then Michael just creamed it. He didn't react. He reacted in the pool and just went after it. Man, what an athlete. I taught him a lot. But think about this. Paul wrote and said that we have been predestined for adoption. Adoption as, as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will. And you know, adoption is an important word to grab a hold of. It's an important word to, to realize because in adoption, you know, we, we have families that adopt children, right? And we have uh, children that are adopted into families. And, and once that adoption takes place, it is a binding agreement to where that child doesn't get to send the parents back. And those parents don't get to send the child back. But it's a binding agreement. A number of years ago, when we still worshiped down in the little building, we adopted a people group from North Africa called the Ishlahain Berbers. They are a people of about 4 million, live in an area about the size of the state of Alabama. They're not Alabama fans. And uh, we adopted them as an unreached people group in the world, and we've been working ever since to carry the gospel in. We don't give up. We keep plugging away. And by the way, if you would like to go to North Africa, our trip has been, our, our time's been shifted, a lot of conflicts. We're looking at next February, so let us know. But here's the deal. We adopt unreached people because here's the thing. We were designed, we were created to last forever. Every single one of us are eternal creatures. We're not like a plant that just has a body. We're not like an animal that just has a body and an intellect so as to know the world around it. But God gave you and I something that nothing else has. He gave us a spirit. And by our spirit, we can know him and he lives in us. And so we've been created in that image of God, and, and we're made to last forever. And, and we're all going to last forever, either with the Lord in, in, in heaven or in a place of separation, in a place of darkness and fire and burning, a place called hell. And so God's number one purpose in our lives is that, that we get to know Him, that we come to the place where we love Him. And then number two is, is all about a spiritual family. You know, uh, Peter wrote and said, love the brotherhood. He said, we're to love each other. You know, you look across this room, you don't know everybody in here. I don't know everybody in here. But I know that I'm supposed to love you, and you're supposed to love me, and we're supposed to love each other. We're to be identified by our love. We are to love the family. So my purpose, number one, is to know and love God. But number two is about my, my spiritual family. And when we talk about the spiritual family, the word we use for that is fellowship. 
Fellowship is like a bunch of fellows being in a ship together. But what is fellowship? Some people say fellowship is casual conversation. Well, if that's, uh, if that's the full definition of fellowship, we have fellowship around here every Sunday. We all have casual conversation. This morning I've had a number of casual conversations, sitting around in the coffee shop having a cup of coffee and and uh, eating a cookie and talking to folks, that's casual conversation, but that's fellowship on le- one level. Another's eating together. That's another way of, of fellowshipping, going to church. The Greek word for fellowship is the word koinonia, it, it, uh, and the meaning is a joint participation in a person or a project as well as a mutuality. So the bottom line is fellowship is loving the family of God. In 1 John chapter 4, verse number 21, this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So, you know, we're given something about this whole idea of knowing and loving God and worshiping God is that we are supposed to love one another. And Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy and said, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things so that if I delay, you may know how you ought to behave in the household and the family of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar or support and a buttress or foundation of the truth, so that you may know how to behave in the family. Now, think about this. We have rules in our families, right? You know, we all know certain things that we're supposed to behave and do and how we're supposed to act in the home and put our dishes in the sink or carry our dirty clothes to the hamper or pick up after ourselves or or whatever else, you know, the household things. Well, there's a way that we're to behave. There's a way that we're to react in this thing called the the family of God, the, the church. And the church of God is family. Therefore, you know, the church, you know, it's not some place you go to, you know, but it's something that you're a part of. And so when we talk about the family of God, there are four levels of fellowship. And level number one is about belonging. And making a choice, choosing to belong. That means you find a church family and you choose to connect. In Ephesians 2.19, the scripture says, So then you who are no longer strangers and aliens, but your fellow citizens or fellow family members with the saints and the members of the household of God, along with every other Christian, we're in something together. And fellowship begins with belonging. And we make that choice. When you and I were born, we didn't get to choose our parents. Really, our parents didn't get to choose us. They chose to have us. They didn't know what we were going to be like. They had these ideals, but, you know, we may have disappointed. We may have put them through a few things they they didn't expect. But when we become a part of the family of God, it's a choice. God draws us and He calls us, but we make that choice in following after Him. You know, we, when we were born in this physical body, we're automatically a part of the human race, but we have to choose to belong to the family of God, to the church. Now, I hear people say, oh man, I can live the Christian life. I don't need the church. I can just love God. That makes no sense because the church is where you live out what it means really to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And, you know, I've known people through the years in in church life, you know, they get angry with uh, uh, another part of the family. There's, you know, say there's somebody that sits on this side of the church, and they get upset with somebody that sits on that side of the church, and so they're just going to pout, and they're going to pick up their toys, and they're all going to go home. That's not very biblical. As a matter of fact, you know, the best example I could think of this week for the community was really a beehive. We've got a picture of a beehive that's coming up on the screen here in just a second. And, and, you know, you think about that beehive. All those bees, they come together, and they work, and they build a building. They've got the hive, right? And you've got a queen bee, and you've got worker bees, and you've got guardian bees, you know, that are on the alert, and they're, they're looking for intruders and all that kind of stuff. But their end purpose is not the hive. Their end purpose is honey. They produce honey honey. Now, you can take a bee away from the hive, and you can put that bee in isolation, but that bee will not thrive. It will strive, and eventually it will die. Now, think about this. You can take a Christian out of fellowship, 
away from the honeycomb, and away from all those other Christians that are stinger Christians and that are worker Christians that are queen Christians and all those different kinds of things. And they'll live for a while, but eventually they're going to shrivel up and they're going to die away. Honeybees live together in the colony and they all work for the common good of the colony. And you can't just live out your purpose as a follower of Jesus Christ and do it all by yourself. As a matter of fact, Paul wrote the Romans in Romans 12 too, and he said, We who are many, we're one body in Christ, and we are individually members of one another. Now that's important. You see, when we became followers of Jesus, we've been called to live in community. We've been called to live, you know, in the community of the hive. You and I, we belong to one another, one another, and the word for that is the word membership, which sounds a little bit strange, but it comes out of that verse in that we're individually members one of another. Your hand is attached to your body. In the same way, you have this same attachment to the body of Christ. But you know, one of the things that has become prevalent in our church culture, and it's all across this nation, and the thing that's become prevalent is churches are filled full of followers of Jesus Christ that can be described as being floaters. And here's what a floater is. A floater says, man, that church pond over there looks really good. Man, just look at all those cattails sitting in there at the, end of the, at the end of the pond. And I hear they got the geese coming in this week. It's going to be rowdy. It's going to be excited. Honk, honk, honk. And the water there is clear and it has no algae in it. You can see right straight to, through to the bottom. You can see the little fish and the big fish and, and, and that, those birds. What a massive choir they are. They're beautiful and they're singing. I'm going to go and float there. And so they go over here to this pond. And they're floating there for a while. And man, sure enough, the birds of the choir, they're magnificent. Man, they, they send chill bumps up and down your spine. And the cattails down there at the end of the pond, they look beautiful, just like stained glass. And the water's clear, and they float there for a little bit, and they begin to notice there's a little bit of algae. And they begin to hear, well, well man, this is, these honkers are just too loud. Honk, 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 you know, all the geese. I'm going to go over this pond. This pond is more traditional. The honkers don't come in that every so often, and they're not loud and clapping their wings and flapping their wings up high in the air. Everything's reserved there and reverent. I'm going to go and float there for a while, and then they get bored with that. Oh, there's a new movement in this pond back up here, and in this pond, man, they've got a new, a new river flowing into it. I'm going to go there. And what happens as a floater, man, Matt, that thing makes you feel tall. You know, uh, you, you float around and you go to all these different things and you never get rooted, you never get plugged in, you never do your part, you never become connected. And you're like a bee trying to live without the hive. And, and, and you know, some people, they, they say, uh, you know, well, I don't understand that. Why I need to attach to other believers. You know, I, 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 I want Jesus, but I don't really want to attach. You know what that's like saying? It's like me walking up to, to one of you. It'd be, it'd be just like me walking up and saying to any one of you, man, I love you. I really love you. You're a, you're a great person, but I can't stand your body. Right? That's exactly what it's saying. Man, I really love you, but I can't stand your body. Let me pick on Kevin and Kayla for a second because they're getting married two weeks from last night. In two weeks on Sunday morning, they will be married and they will be in church on the front row. Probably not. But Kevin and Kayla, they're getting married, right? He's, our, he's up in the sound booth. Can you imagine him telling his bride, I really love you, but I just can't stand your body. That wouldn't go over. He'd have a knot on the top of his head from a frying pan that would touch the roof. 
And so many people, this is what they do to Jesus. They say, Jesus, I love you. My hands are up high. My heart's beating for you. I feel the, 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 the thrill up and down my spine. Oh, Jesus, I love you. But I just can't stand your body. And you know what he calls his body? Jesus, he calls us his bride. We're the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when people say that, it's, a, it's the ultimate insult. So we need to make that choice to belong. In 1 Corinthians, the Bible says, you know, that we were all baptized into one body. The symbol for that belonging is baptism. We were baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were made to drink of one spirit. You know, that tells me you don't have to be rich, you don't have to be poor, you don't have to be anything in between. You don't have to be a certain race. You don't have to be a, a certain culture. But Jesus is for everybody. Whosoever will, everybody. Jesus is for everybody. And what happens when a person's baptized is we're identifying with Christ. When you see it happen up here in the baptistry, we take that person down into the, gra- into the water. We call that a watery grave. Going down in that water, they've died with Christ. They're buried with Christ at the bottom. And when we raise them up, they're, they're symbolizing that they have uh, resurrected with Christ as well. In the book of Romans, it tells us this. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? And we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised uh, from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we've been united with him in in, in death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in the resurrection like his. And so baptism becomes that symbol of our belonging. So level one is choosing to belong, but level two is is learning to share. And it's at this point that that the fellowship gets a little bit deeper. We're getting out into the pond of that church. We're not just on the edge and looking at the cattails. We're not just sitting back there on the back row and saying, not just... Not just picking on you back row folks. But, but we're not sitting back there and saying, oh, don't the birds of that choir just sing beautifully. We're no longer being that observer, but we're going a little bit deeper into the pond, getting a little bit further out away from the shore. And this is where friendship begins to happen. And, and we're being, we, now we being created in the image of God, we're designed for that. We're designed for relationship. As a matter of fact, God said when He designed us and when He created us, it's not good that man would be alone. In Acts chapter 2 verse 44, we've got the formation of the ancient church right after Christ has ascended back into glory and there's been the the power of Pentecost. And this is what it says. All who believed were together and they had all things in common. In other words, they shared everything. They shared everything. You know, at your house, do you share everything? Just about? You know, my kids think what's mine is theirs. Does that happen at your house? You know, it's like my boys. If they're running low on golf balls, they'll raid my golf bag. You know, we we back up to a golf course, and so I'm able to get golf balls out of the backyard. There's a lot of horrible golfers out there. But sometimes I'll go to my bag, and and my ball section is empty. Because we share. We share. We share everything. And, and, And the more we hang out, and the closer, we're, the closer we're going to be. And, and most people are lonely because they fail to make time for friendships. They're busy achieving, they're, they're busy building, they're busy making, but they're not building and achieving and creating friendships. But here we read that they shared everything. You know, I, I cannot help but that sharing everything to, to believe that it means everything. They shared their experiences. Peter wrote and said, or not Peter, but Paul, the proverb is Solomon wrote and said, you know, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Earlier in our light conversation, we were talking about sling blades for some reason here in the lobby. How many of you know what a sling blade is? Some of you don't. It's an ancient tool before the day of weed eaters. 
Basically, it's a blade attached to a stick, and you sling back and forth, and if you get really good at it and your blade is sharp, you can do a better job than a weed eater. You won't have ups and downs and ripples and all that kind of stuff. You don't have to rewind that twine all the time. But um, we're talking about sling blades. Now, you got to keep it sharp. You know, it's a metal blade. You know, when you go to sharpen it, you don't use a crayon to sharpen it. But you use something hard, not like iron sharpens iron. You use a sharpening stone. And, and that's what the way it is, you know, in the body of Christ. You know, we sharpen one another because we're living through experiences together. We learn from the experiences of others. Thank you for the testimonies I've heard this week concerning last week's message and your follow-through on reading 1 John. I, I noticed one on Facebook. Thanks, uh, uh, Stephen A. Davies, uh, for the spider web. Uh, I think that was Mandy Trawick who did that. Reminding her to read First John, you know, and then I, I had a couple of text messages and, and, and one of them, you know, shared the encouragement they found there and the encouragement and an experience that I'd shared with them in my life. And, uh, and it's through our experiences. You know, there's nobody in this room that's never known pain. There's nobody in this room that's never known a win. There's nobody in this room that's never known something in between. And, and we build uh, up one another as we share our experiences and as we encourage and as we lift up and as we do all these different kinds of things. And then the second way that they shared was they shared in hospitality. They shared their homes. As a matter of fact, you know, Peter says this, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. How many of you ever grumble about showing hospitality? Thank you. I'm glad there's three people in the church that are like me. You know, you're getting ready to have hospitality, people over to your house. And your wife is making you do things that you're not accustomed to doing on a regular basis. Oh, man, you just get grumpy. Or I get grumpy. I wish these people weren't even coming over here. Right? That's what I'm thinking. I don't verbalize it because I'm going to get hit with a frying pan just like Kevin would. Right? And then when the people get there, it's just like, it's so good to see you. Can you identify with that? You know, but we're supposed to show hospitality. We're supposed to show hospitality to strangers. The Bible says in doing so, sometimes we entertain angels unaware. We're to show hospitality. You know, some of the greatest hospitality I've ever discovered has been hospitality that's been shown to me in other places around the world. One such occasion, it was uh, no, uh, September the 11th of 2001 in Ukraine. Herb and I were in one of the homes, and the rest of our team was in a home about a mile down the road, and Herb and I got sent there because the other home was out of, uh, out of bedding and all that kind of a stuff, and, and they had beds there for us, and uh, the other guys, they, they, that home cooked better, actually, but this home was okay. And, and Herb was a picky eater. He looked at some of the stuff they brought us, and they're like freaking out. I mean, you know, just a fried egg with a sardine on it on a piece of toast for breakfast. I mean, that was kind of usual. It's okay. But, you know, their hospitality, they opened up their home. They gave us the largest room in the house. They, they fed us at the table three meals a day. I still remember those babuskas, you know, as they, as they prepared. I, I'm speaking to you guys because y'all are part of that culture but, you know, they, they're preparing the food and, 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 and some of the greatest meals that, you know, they put everything, their hospitality, they open their home. And on that particular evening, as Herb and I sat down to dinner, I don't even remember what the food was. There's always fresh fruits and vegetables. But they came to get me to look at the television to show me the planes hitting the World Trade Center. And in that moment of fellowship, and what an odd time for fellowship, they shared in the experience. They cried with us. And they loved with us. And they walked with us. And for those days to come. Because part of our team would not be able to get out of the Crimea. I would spend several days in Vienna and fly an empty plane back to Washington, D.C. and an even emptier plane down to Fort Walton Beach. But they shared with us. And man, I'm glad I had somebody to share with. Because if I was by myself, I'd be like that lone bee on that Delta flight. 
coming from Reagan back to Valpy and be the only one on board. But Herb was there, the two of us. We were the only passengers on the plane. But it's fellowship. Fellowship is sharing our experiences, but fellowship you know, is sharing our homes, and it's in hospitality, and we share our problems. Paul wrote the Galatians to bear one another's burdens. You know, if, if, you're, if you share your joy, it's doubled, and if you share your, your burdens, it's halved. In Hebrews 10.25, then it tells us, don't neglect the meat together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day, the day of the Lord, approaching. You know, we live in a time of of seeming increased anarchy. Milwaukee's on fire this morning. Louisiana is underwater. LSU's had to put off uh, the moving in of dorms today because of all the flooding. I mean, we live in a world that's a mess. We live in a nation that thinks if we elect the right man or woman to be president, all of our problems will be solved. That's not going to happen. What's going to happen if we look to Jesus to be king? That's when the problems are solved. But we need to be meeting together and joined together and worshiping together and honoring God together and loving one another together as we see that day approaching. Level three is not only sharing, but it's about doing my part. It's about partnership. God didn't bring you to village to sit and to soak on the edge of the pond. He brought you not for the spiritual spa, but he, inv- he brought you to get out there, to go deep, and to help encourage and bring others to go deep with you. He brought you here to serve. God wants to make a difference in other people's lives through your life. He wants to make a difference in His church through you. You are why you're here, is to honor Him and to serve Him. And in every family, there's responsibilities. And at Village, as a Christian family, as God's family, we all have a part to do. Fifty-eight times in the New Testament, we're told to do our part. So level two, you know, it's about sharing our heart, but level three, going deeper, it's about doing our part. As a matter of fact, Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, for we are God's fellow workers. Fellow workers. You're God's field. You're God's building. We're God's fellow workers. And we're partners in spreading the gospel. And that's talking about fellowship with God and with one another. And as a part of the church, you know, you're part of the greatest team that's ever been assembled. Did you hear that? I mean, our Olympic team is a pretty doggone great Olympic team. I mean, they, they've been doing marvelous. They're awesome. What athletes they are. Makes me even think I can tumble sometimes. You know, football season's about to start. We'll be talking about the greatness of our teams. But the greatest team that has ever been assembled is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've got the greatest mission. Our our mission is not just to produce honey, but our mission is to share the gospel. To share the gospel, the good news that Jesus saves, Jesus saves. And, And what we do, it doesn't last for just the season. It doesn't last till the next Olympics in four years. But what we do, it lasts for all of eternity. As a matter of fact, in the Ephesians, we read, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. See, when we're working right, we're building ourselves up in love. Love of God and love of one another. Someone talked to Mother Teresa once, who spent her life working with the poorest of the poor in Calcutta, India. And this is the question they asked. How do you handle all the death and disease on a daily basis? How do you handle all the death and disease on a daily basis? Now, I've been to some needy places. But probably the, the neediest place I ever was was in Jakarta, Indonesia. When I'd go out of my hotel onto the street, I would run into the beggar with leprosy. 
And when my ride would pick me up to carry me to the next church to preach, I would see people covered in leprosy, some missing fingers and some missing toes and some missing hands and feet, and all dying. I remember one lady covered in leprosy, the sores eating away at her skin, holding a baby that looked perfect. But that need, can you imagine facing that every single day? And this is what Mother Teresa said about how she handled it. She said, every person I bathe, every person I bandage, I imagine seeing the face of Jesus, and I do it for him. And as I learn to get plugged in and to do my part, this is what I do. I imagine the face of Jesus in that crying baby that I'm holding to allow its parents to be in worship. As I do my part, I imagine the face of Jesus in that child that's running up to hug me because I'm here again this week. As I do my part, I imagine the face of Jesus with that person walking into the office in dire need. As I serve at Bruce with the endless need, I imagine the face of Jesus as I bring cans to make a thousand cans of vegetables and as I serve. As I go to Hawaii on that mission trip in October, I imagine the face of Jesus upon those people with whom I will meet and serve. In Dominican Republic with the endless need of the refugee hungry children, I see the face of Jesus doing our part. Okay, so we get there, and there's one more level I want to carry you to, and we'll wrap it up. And this is a fun one. Spread the love. Spread the love. As a matter of fact, that's the deepest level. Man, we're in deep. We're spreading the love. We're reaching out to people on the edge of the pond. We're reaching out to the people among the cattails. We're reaching out to the choir of birds. And there's a living water that's begun to flow into our own pond, and, and, and God is just working. It reminds me of a family I know that I want to share one of their family films with you right now. See if you recognize it. Listen to a story about a man named Jed. A poor mountaineer barely kept his family fed. And then one day he was shooting at some food. And up through the ground come a bubbling crude. Oil, that is. Black gold. Texas tea. Well, the first thing you know, old Jed's a millionaire. The kinfolk said, Jed, move away from there. Said, California is the place you ought to be. So they loaded up the truck and they moved to Beverly. Hills, that is. Swimming pools, movie stars. The Beverly Hillbilly. How many of you grew up watching the Beverly Hillbillies? How many of you never heard of the Beverly Hillbillies? Oh, man, Ian, I thought you had an education. Don't you know that's your kin? But this is the word I liked in that opening song. The kin folks said, Jed, move away from there. And here's what the encouragement of the kin folks was. Jed, you know, we see potential. We see a future, man. You may not see it in that, in that Texas T, but there's a future there, man. We lift you up. And that's what Ken Folks does. We, we are Ken Folks. I'm sounding like Ken Folks. That's what, that's what Ken Folks do. We, we lift up one another. We, we spread that love. And it literally means, you know, those people that are closest to us, our next of kin, we, belo- we love them like family. We love them because they are family, this thing called the church of God. Now, you go back to that ancient church that I spoke about in Acts chapter 2 a moment ago. Here it is again. In in verse 42, and I'm going to focus on two phrases, they devoted themselves to. I'm not going to focus on the apostles' teaching or on the breaking of bread and the prayer. They devoted themselves to fellowship. 
to fellowship. And Romans 12, 10 says, be good friends who love deeply. Again, that word for fellowship is koinonia, literally meaning uh, being committed to one another as we are to Jesus Christ. It means living sacrificially. The Bible tells us God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's John 3.16. In 1 John 3.16, the Bible says, By this we know love that He laid down His life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. That's the deepest level of fellowship. It means that we're there with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ as they face suffering and heartache and pain. We don't stand as a free church or as a persecuted church, but we stand as a church of Jesus Christ. And when our brothers and sisters are persecuted in the far-reaching lands, we feel with them. As we rejoice, they rejoice with us. And that's what life's about. It's about loving God and learning to love this thing called the family of God. Life is not about accomplishment. It's really easy to get wrapped up in accomplishment, but life is about relationships. We're we're here to love God, and we're here to know His His family forever. Knowing God and knowing the family. So that brings me to the text. It's kind of a backwards way of doing an exposition upon a text. But in Mark 12, 28, this is what the Bible says. And one of the scribes, they they came up and they heard them disputing with one another. Heard them disputing. You know, I kind of imagine this as these disciples just, you know, having this dispute. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, well, you know, which commandment is the most important of all? Now, if you had a chance to ask Jesus, what's the most important thing? I think this is what Jesus would tell you. Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And then Jesus goes a little bit further. And he says the second one is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. These, there are no other commandment. There is no other commandment greater than these. You know, people say, Pastor, I just want to get deep with the Lord. Oh, I hear this one. I'm changing ponds because my pond's not deep enough. I had a lady from Mississippi show up in a Bible study on a Wednesday night a couple years ago. And she just wanted to harp about her pond not being deep enough in Mississippi. And her pastor not being deep enough in Mississippi. Here's my question. Have you learned to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength? And to love your neighbors yourself. I've not met a Christian that's gotten beyond those first two. I have not. Did you hear me? I have never met a Christian in all of my life that has gotten beyond those first two. So don't go telling me your pond's not deep enough. And don't tell me your pastor's not deep enough. And that your deacons are not deep enough. And your elders are not deep enough. And your Sunday school teacher is not deep enough. Until you have learned to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your strength, all of your soul. And to love your neighbors yourself, you're not deep enough. And here's my confession. I'm not deep enough. I don't love God like that. But you're the pastor. I'm a man just like you are. I struggle just like you struggle. I show hospitality with grumbling. Some of you caught that, didn't you? Right? I'm just being honest. So I've not gotten past the first one, much less loving my neighbor as myself. You know where that first showed up? Beverly and I were in seminary, right? Fort Worth, Texas. Seminary students have no money. 
Did y'all know that? I mean, they are poor. But on this particular day, we had enough money to go to Chick-fil-A and to get a Chick-fil-A sandwich and an order of fries and a drink. And we're kind of cutting back on what we're eating. And I told her, I said, well, I just read where you, if you feel full, you ought to stop. Well, she stopped with half of her sandwich. You know how I loved her as myself. I sacrificed and ate her other half. I have not heard the end of that in 32 years. <laughs> but learning to sacrifice. Learning to love somebody better than I love me. And loving God above all. Okay, so here's the thing I want you to do this week. Some of you took the challenge last week. Some of you said, man, I, I hate that I missed out on it. Seven by seven, what's that? Seven minutes a day, I'm going to pray seven days a week. Okay, number two, we're going to read First Timothy, or 1 Timothy, however you want to call it. Spend your time this week, read First Timothy, and seven by seven prayer. And I wrote a prayer on the back of your notes. I wrote you some instructions on the back of your note to take home and to put to work, to put into action, put this message into use in your life. Okay? Now, next Sunday, I'm going to ask you how you're doing. I'm going to ask you if you showed hospitality without grumbling. Without. With somebody that you didn't want to show hospitality to. It's easy to show hospitality to those that we like. But it's even more of a challenge for those that we don't like as much. So I'm going to challenge that way. Now, some of you today, listen, you've never trusted Christ so as to belong. You've never been baptized. You don't have a testimony to say that you died with Christ in his likeness and you were buried with him in his death and you were raised in his resurrection. And there's people in the room this morning that need to come to that place. The Spirit's testifying with your spirit that this is your opportunity, that this is your day. That's God drawing you. Could I encourage you as we sing this song in just a second to let go of what's holding you back and come and say, Pastor, I want to follow Christ. I want to trust my life to Him. Would you do that? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and the blessings of it. We thank you for the truth of your word. And Lord, we ask you to help us to love you with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength. And likewise, Lord, we ask you to help us to love our neighbor as ourself. To you be the glory in these moments of decision. Amen.